This is Melissa, and today is the 30th of June, the last day of June, 2024, and I hope everyone is doing all right. I am going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to replay for you tonight, and also let you know that this is a bridge between the real history that I did on Thursday with John Euler, who is a, a counselor, licensed professional counselor, and we talked about psychopathy. And we just spoke again earlier today, and that is going to go up as a part two real history next Thursday. And I hope that some of you have found that to be useful and interesting. We talked about Kinsey and the work that Kinsey did in the 50s, and after that Real History on Thursday, I also linked to a couple of videos. One was called The Kinsey Effect, and the other was called Kinsey's Pedophiles, and there might, there might be another one, The Kinsey Syndrome. But I re-watched a couple of these this week, and they're very powerful. And Kinsey was a sexologist, and in the 50s, his book really changed the way that sexuality was perceived. His first book was on male sexuality, and he followed that up a few years later with one on female sexuality. And these books, basically, they were fraudulent in their methodology and he used prostitutes and called them average women. He used pedophiles and homosexual men and called them average men. And what this did was it completely skewed the way America and later the world viewed sex. And in the one of the documentaries, and I'll link to them all here, I was reminded that Dr. Judith Reisman, who has since passed away, quoted liberally from the book that Alan Watt has mentioned often, entitled Foundations, Their Power and Influence by Renee Wormser. And this was written in 1958, and Kinsey's first book it might have been published in the late 40s, but Playboy was launched in 1953, and Hugh Hefner, who started that, even called himself Kinsey's pamphleteer. You know, he was he was promoting it in the mainstream, what Kinsey had done in this so-called academic research. But what Reisman was pointing out is what Alan told you, is that the Rockefeller Foundation paid for this so-called research that Kinsey did, which included abuse of, on children. It's horrific stuff, and I don't, I don't want to take the time to go too deep into that. I will post the documentaries that you can look at yourself. But before I launch into reading a little bit from foundations or power and influence and talking about some of the other articles that I wanted to mention. I went through Alan's talks and I just searched for times that he mentioned Kinsey, which was quite a few. And the interesting thing that I noticed is that he tended to mention Kinsey, pornography, uh, social degradation, cultural warfare, at the same time that he was talking about other things that were occurring in culture or that we were living through, agendas that we were living through, like Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030, climate change, the climate change agenda. In this episode that I'm going to play, it was Maurice Strong who started the whole ball going with the UN and the Rio summit back in the early 90s and man-made global warming. And after listening to bits of several talks that Alan did, 
what I realized that he was always doing was showing the deep connection between personal degradation and cultural degradation and then what could be done to us. So the more that we slide morally down the scale, the easier it is for this agenda to go forward in a variety of ways. And I thought that that was interesting, so I started to look to see what was going on in the world and how that might tie into that theme. And after I pulled up a few articles this afternoon, what I realized is I kept coming back to Canada and I realized that in so many ways, Canada, you know, the great white north, that uh, benign seeming country up there has been instrumental in so many huge culture changes. I found an article that was written several months ago in the National Post by Tristan Hopper. First reading, Canada is becoming a globally recognized lesson in what not to do. In just the last week, there have been two separate columns in British newspapers framing Canada as a model of what not to do. Both were inspired by the tabling of Bill 63, the Liberals' online harms bill. The Spectator said that it effectively engendered the founding of a Canadian thought police. The Telegraph cited it as evidence that Canada's descent into tyranny is almost complete. Now, I've mentioned this repeatedly. This is free speech. This is thought crime. This is scary. Back to the article. This didn't used to happen. In other words, other people didn't point out that Canada was descending into tyranny. So the writer says, this didn't used to happen. It wasn't too long ago that Canadian politics were famously inaccessible to the wider world. For Canada's 2008 federal election, The Spectator covered it with a blog post that mostly mused on how nobody cared. It's curious that Canada receives almost no foreign coverage, even in Britain, where there are, after all, plenty of people with Canadian relatives or connections. But now, on topics ranging from assisted suicide to housing affordability to internet regulation, it's not infrequent that Canada will be cited in foreign parliaments and in foreign media as the very model of a worst-case scenario. It was just six months ago that The Telegraph scored a viral hit with a mini-documentary framing the political situation in Canada as a warning to the West. Under Justin Trudeau, Canada has sought to position itself as the global bastion of progressive politics, reads a synopsis for the film Canada's Woke Nightmare, which has garnered more than 5 million views. The documentary notes that Canada is now at the absolute global vanguard of progressive issues including harm reduction, assisted suicide, and gender ideology. Canada now has the world's most liberalized assisted suicide regime and the world's highest rate of deaths attributable to euthanasia. Canada was the first country to go all in on supervised consumption as a response to rising overdose rates. And BC is the first jurisdiction to distribute free recreational opioids under the rubric of safer supply. And in just the last few years, Canada's rules governing transgender identity have been pushed even further than equivalent policies across much of Europe. As one example, Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon was forced to resign last year, in part due to controversy that her government had allowed convicted rapists to secure transfer to women's prisons simply by self-identifying as female. Trudeau enacted the exact same policy in 2018 and with the same effect that it allowed sex offenders to transfer to women's prison. Nevertheless, the issue has gone almost unremarked in Canadian discourse. 
The thrust of Canada's woke nightmare is that this social revolution has mostly been to the country's detriment and should be heeded by Western nations looking to follow the same path. The UK is currently studying a proposal to legalize doctor-assisted suicide, and during parliamentary hearings, it was Canada that was presented as the example of what to avoid. I would say that Canada is a warning sign for countries that legalize medical assistance in dying. Trudeau Lemons, a University of Toronto bioethicist, told a UK committee last June. The phrase, warning to the world, was also used in a recent profile on Canadian euthanasia published in the magazine Spite. Rather than tackle the health and economic challenges Canadian society is facing, the government is effectively offering an early death as a solution to life's ills. And now they are attempting to regulate the internet for free speech and what they call the Online Harms Act. So I'll post that article. You can look at the rest of it. But here's one that the the hypocrisy and irony of it struck me. This is from CTV News. Don't care, says pro-suicide website linked to Kenneth Law of Canada's Online Harms Act. The operators of a pro suicide website forum linked to dozens of deaths around the world said they have nothing but disdain for attempts by Canadian lawmakers to introduce new safety standards to protect children. Don't care about Canadian law, the operators of the website wrote to CTV News Toronto in a text message, along with an instruction not to message them again when reached for comment on proposed changes to Canada's Online Harms Act. So, whatever this website is, it's offering young people advice and tools that they can purchase on how to commit suicide. And several um, Canadian teenagers and young people have had their suicides linked to this site. And so CTV and the Canadian government, they're outraged about it, but just think about this. Just think about that. And I'm going to give you another article here from February of this year from CBC. Misunderstanding of mental illness clouds made expansion, patient and psychiatrists say. Now, MAID stands for Medical Assistance in Dying. This is Canada's assisted suicide. Canadians suffering from debilitating mental illness cannot yet legally qualify for medical assistance in dying, unlike almost all others with severe illnesses, a restriction some advocates feel is rooted in misunderstanding. Eligibility for MAID was set to expire in March to include people with mental illness. But on Thursday, Health Minister Mark Holland introduced legislation that will delay the expansion of assisted suicide or assisted dying to include those suffering solely from mental illness to 2027. He accepted the majority recommendations of a parliamentary committee that warned Canada's health system is not ready to allow MAID for people with only a mental illness because there's too much work to do before the legislation was set to expand. At least, although that is the official stance on it, but in reality, many people in Canada have already been offered this, as long as they can find the, let's just call it a comorbidity, but something else to go along with it. So it's very much a functional possibility for the mentally ill in Canada. But, um, you know, they will go after this website who is uh, doing their own assisted suicide. You you see, you're, you're, you're playing with legalities here because the moral uh, slope has already been slid down. 
Here's one from Pink News. So uh, I think this is yesterday, Pink News, and we can guess what kind of a site that is. Tired of the UK? These are the world's most progressive countries for trans people. Okay, well, we'll skip the first two. I'll tell you that the first two countries that are really trans-friendly are Spain and Iceland. But number three on the list is Canada. Canada's reputation as an inclusive country for trans people has become all the more welcome given the rise of transphobia in the neighboring U.S. I, I, I think this is a pretty trans-friendly country here, but carrying on. The country is widely known as a refuge for trans Americans seeking to escape the volatility of politics in their homeland. It's a reputation that is more than justified with protective laws and recognition of trans people spanning across legislation, including the recognition of non-binary people, housing discrimination prevention laws, and no restrictions on changing gender. If that's not enough, 78% of Canadians support protecting trans people, while 58% back trans health care for everyone, including those under the age of 18. Before I move off of Canada, I do want to remind you that the company Pornhub, which is one of the most popular internet pornography video sharing sites is Canadian owned internet company. I'm not sure who the actual owners are. And it's been around for, it says here, 17 years and it is owned by somebody named Solomon Friedman, founded by somebody named Matt Keezer. Um, so there you go. Oh, this is interesting. It says in March of 2010, the company was purchased by Fabian Thielman, a German businessman. Interesting name. And he was the founder and managing partner of the internet pornography conglomerate Manwin. All right, so that's enough about that. It's a Canadian company. But what is interesting is that Pornhub grew in popularity at the time of COVID. In fact, I think it said that between March and April of 2020, its viewership grew by 24%. I'll post up a couple of articles here, one from the NIH. Actually, they might both be from the NIH. The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Pornography Habits, a Global Analysis of Google Trends. Is the COVID-19 spread globally? Social distancing, self-isolation, quarantine, and national lockdowns have become crucial to control the pandemic. However, these measures may also lead to increases in social isolation, loneliness, and stress, which can alter the consumption of pornography habits. The aim of the study was thus to explore the interest pattern in pornography and coronavirus-themed pornography during the COVID-19 outbreak. Google Trends was employed to determine the most popular porn websites, porn XNXX, Pornhub, Xvideos, and Xhamster. And coronavirus-themed pornography worldwide. Now, that's an interesting one. Evidently, there's a whole subgenre of pornography with a coronavirus theme. Go figure. And another article from the NIH PubMed, How the Rise of Problematic Pornography Consumption and the COVID-19 Pandemic Has Led to a Decrease in Physical Sexual Interactions and Relationships and an Increase in Addictive Behaviors and Cluster B Personality Traits. What you will find a lot when you 
look for links between pornography consumption and violence, um, criminal behavior, criminal violence, is a huge supply, a never-ending supply of so-called scholarly papers that say that there is no link. Every once in a while there's one that says, well, that it could be, maybe, possibly. But the, these academics are the same ones who jumped on the Kinsey bandwagon all those decades ago, back in the 50s. And this is the Rockefeller Foundation that supported that. And the interesting thing about Reisman in that documentary was she said that Wormser, the author of Foundations, Their Power and Influence, had said that that he was approached, the, the committee was approached by some senator who saw the direction they were going and said, you absolutely cannot use these documents that you have received, the actual statistics and numbers and papers and so forth that they had received um, about the Kinsey Institute and about the initial research that was used. This is how damning that would have been at that time, that it was literally squashed by this senator and I'm sure many others who were backing him and behind them. And, you know, if you if you want this... Uh, the Reese Commission to see the light of day if you want this book published. But uh, Wormser gets a lot in there anyway on Kinsey. And he says here on page 100, uh, evidently he had been writing about a Professor Hobbes and his assertion that social scientists should exercise the greatest care in informing the public when their work is not truly, quote, scientific, end quote. Wormser writes, the very term social science implies that their conclusions are unassailable because they are scientifically arrived at. There is the constant danger, then, that laymen will take these conclusions as axiomatic bases for social action. Perhaps the best illustration of this is the remarkable number of writings which appeared after the publication of the reports on the Rockefeller Foundation-supported Kinsey Studies. With the assumedly scientific character of Dr. Kinsey's work behind us, we had such things offered to the public as this one by Anne G. Freegood in the September 1953 issue of Harper's, who wrote, The desert in this case is our current code of laws governing sexual activities and the background of Puritan tradition regarding sex under which this country still, to some extent, operates. Later on, she wrote that the first Kenzie report has already been cited in court decisions and quoted in textbooks as well as blazoned from one end of the country to the other. Professor Hobbes in Social Problems and Scientism, page 93, described the aftermath of Dr. Kinsey's Rockefeller Foundation-supported first report as follows. Despite the patent limitations of the study and its persistent bias, its conclusions regarding sexual behavior were widely believed. They were presented to college classes. Medical doctors cited them in lectures. Psychiatrists applauded them. A radio program indicated that the findings were serving as a basis for revision of moral codes relating to sex and an editorial in a college student newspaper admonished the college administration to make provisions for sexual outlets for the students in accordance with the scientific realities as established by the book. Some of these Kinseyites have said that our laws are wrong 
because they do not follow the biological facts. Published reports such as those of Kinsey can do immeasurable harm when they falsely pretend to disclose biological facts. A great part of the Kinsey product is without basis in true fact and is mere propaganda for some personally intriguing concepts. Well, this is so sad because this was written in 1958. And the, those laws have been effectively changed. And those of you who watch the documentaries that I link to will be horrified. I mean, you really know who Kinsey was. And I know that Alan has talked about him for years. And many of you will already be fully aware of the fraud perpetrated on us but some of you are new to this information. And the reason why I stress it, I'm, I've run out of time here and voice. I'm starting my coughing thing here. And so I'm, I'm not going to take the time to talk about <clears throat> all of the uh, climate things that I, I wanted to mention tonight. But suffice it to say that the climate fraud, the climate scam, continues on. Uh, is is constantly we are having new laws and um, new limitations on our freedoms as a result of so-called man-made climate change. And Alan, like I said, he always tied all of this together. The poem that goes along with this talk which is from Republic Broadcasting Network on June 7, 2010. Manipulative masters, sons of perdition, blame the conquered for world's condition. Those who vote hope to relieve the strain, newly elected now promise years of pain, and baby boomers given cultural dysfunction are blamed for chaos and financial destruction. So it's all your fault. You lived too well, say the financial gatekeepers, engineers of hell. Double speak, reverse blame is psychopaths' dictum, where perpetrators turn to blame the victim whose conditioned confusion, firewall mentality will inhibit him reaching factual reality. Geopolitical, psychological, familial disasters, courtesy, financial, educational, media masters. It's a good talk, and uh, but before I leave you with this talk, since I had gone through so many of Alan's talks, looking for things that he said about Kinsey, and in this one, you know, I, I made the show notes here, but I called him the pervert Kinsey, and that sums it up. I found another poem from another talk, October the 4th, 2010. Semen and Blood. An Ode to Kinsey and Sponsor Foundation. Freeing the beast of desolation. Society to be destroyed. End of each norm. Out of the chaos. New designer when born. The culture industry was doing its best. Movie after movie. More people undressed. Computer and net moved into high gear. Proving the warnings the wise did fear. Like movie Videodrome. For sickos out there, casualties of real thing increase as they dare. No morals left to say, that's enough. As porno is acceptable, pushing its snuff into the minds of new addicts, doing the bidding of masters who program, good at ridding themselves of the fallout, saying it's about adult entertainment. They lyingly shout, this doesn't help victims like Tia Rigg, the fallout of industry not carrying a fig, raped 
Murdered by uncle, fantasy fulfilled. Addicted to porn, he planned and then killed his 12-year-old niece, getting his jollies. Culture industry will say, own fault, own follies. Society destroyed, dysfunctional and sore with moral relativity, rotten to the core. And I'm just going to touch on the story of Tia Rigg before I sign off here. Because, remember, I said you'll see these studies over and over. Academics, so-called academic studies, the same academics who tell us that boys might be girls and girls might be boys. And they should be given the hormones. And if you live in Canada under Bill C-16 as a parent, your rights are stripped. They're gone to say anything about this. This happened in Manchester, England in April of 2010. Tia Rigg was tortured, raped, and murdered by her maternal uncle, John Maiden. 38-year-old maiden had pled guilty to the crime and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he should never be released, meaning that he will likely remain in prison until he dies. It's said that her uncle had an obsessive interest in pornography relating to pedophilia, rape, and torture. He telephoned his sister asked for the young girl to be able to come over and babysit his 10-year-old daughter. He drugged her and inflicted a horrific catalog of sexual injuries to her before stabbing her and strangling her. And I will not give you more of the details. I will link to this. But you can find current stories. And you will also find the current stories and the current so-called studies in academia that say, oh, no, there's no relation. You know, we just can't find any correlation between extremely violent pornography and pedophilic pornography and um, a rise in sexual crimes. And that's just rubbish. And so what has happened in the time between Kinsey and between foundations, their power and influence, which exposed so much about how things are really run. We have just gone on this slippery slope, down, down, down. And I have always thought that what Alan was doing in his recap, his regular recap of the awful news, that part of it, was hoping that there was some moral indignation that could be summoned up by people, that people would hear his chronicling of the news and they would come out of their torpor, their, their stupor, and want to do something about it. And so I have that same hope. And as I said, I'll be doing a part two with John Euler that will go up on Thursday. And I also want to mention for the Tragedy and Hope Book Club that Nick from Hayes Reviews um, led a good talk today and I was able to be there for about 45 minutes before I had to go for that other talk with John Euler. He did a good job. I will be editing that and putting it into a video and I'm really hopeful that I will have it out by Thursday. I have a lot going on and as always I seem to be running behind on everything but that will be coming and hit the, the talk covered chapter 8 International Socialism and the Soviet Challenge. And it, it was what I heard was very interesting. So I'm looking forward to hearing the final part myself. 
And the reading assignment for July are chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 is Germany from Kaiser to Hitler, 1913 to 1945, and Britain, the background to appeasement, 1900 to 1939. And I know that I throw a lot of homework your way, but I really do hope that some of you take the time to listen to these real histories with John Euler and also to watch the documentaries exposing the who who Kenzie really was and why it matters is because this is the world that we live in now completely shaped by the scientific fraud perpetrated first on the American people and then globally. All right, take care, have a good week, and I will be back later. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and we're cutting into the Matrix on June the 7th, 2010. Now the newcomers should look into cutting through the matrix.com website. Bookmark all the other sites you see on that front page because sometimes there's problems with the com or the others, but one way or another you'll always have a site to download the latest shows from if you bookmark them for future use. While you're there, remember, you can go in to uh, articles for sale, the books, CDs, DVDs, and purchase them because they're, they're different from what you normally read. I show you the little tricks of the trade that are used down through the ages to the present time in language and how things are presented to you by symbolism, and how really you're programmed by those who understand this. Mankind is very, very old indeed, far older than the nonsense that uh, Charles Darwin was spewing out. And the whole trick of managing whole populations for a a tiny minority uh, is very, very old. They understand the sciences of managing the herd, and that's what we are. We have a planned society, a planned future, And if you look at all the institutions involved in future planning, it's astronomical. And they're all, of course, tax-free, exempt foundations and charitable causes and so on. So we're we're run by private organizations, and we have the guise of democracy to implement the plans of these private organizations who all work together along the same path to manage the big herd, you see, and to ensure that they live very well off of us forever. Now... Purchase the books and so on. That keeps me going. You can always use a personal check from the U.S. to Canada. Uh, just uh, send a personal check as cash here in Canada. No problem at all. You can't accept personal checks from any other country to Canada, but the U.S. is okay because we're all one country now, really. And you can also use an international postal money order from the U.S. to Canada. Cash is all okay, too. At the moment, uh, they still will you know, cash uh, the devalued money of Europe as Canada goes down too, because we're all in it together, mind you. It's all one big, happy, miserable family as we go down together. And uh, at the moment, they still cash them, so cash is okay. You know, I've read so many articles recently on the university studies and the foundational studies to do with data overload. It's a process. It's an intentional process that comes out of having the Internet and they're really so interested to see our habits, you see, are we really taking to this addiction, this drug addiction of the Internet as we're supposed to? Um, are the big boys playing their parts by giving us intriguing information and, and uh, titillating information as well? If you notice, there's more and more mainstream coming across the Internet all the time from the big uh, regular newspapers and media outlets with the same kind of stuff, the trashy stuff, you know, the bimbo stuff and, and the boob job stuff and, and the fair stuff with the Hollywood characters and lots of uh, oohs and ahs about UFOs and all the stuff you've had in the rags for years. That's what they call the tabloid papers, the rags. And last week I talked about uh, a very good documentary done on it, uh, on the particular industry that gives you this information, which you think is real, how they cook up the data, how they stage events, how they even get protest movements and hire the protesters, anything for news. And that was Star Suckers, the, I think it was BBC Four. Uh, see it before you, you, you soak up this trash you're getting. Back with more after these messages. 
This is Alan Watt, and we're cutting through the matrix, talking about the media overload we're given. And it doesn't matter which camp you want to put yourself into. I don't think it's a good idea putting yourself into camps anyway. They're generally set up for you. Uh, You're supplied with endless data and, and data overload and spins and so on. And there's all kinds of camps competing uh, to give out information and, and exposés about what's happening in the world. And some of it's not bad, and some of it's got some good truth in it. There's always spins here and there, too, um, because that's how we're managed. We're managed. I've always said when you awake, when you're truly awake into reality, it's like coming out a tunnel that's underground, and you're coming up to the surface, and you see the field. And then you want to get across that field to the trees. You just know that's your goal, to get into that forest. But you've got to get across the field, and there's all these signs pointing this way, and no, it's this way. We've got the answer. And, and you go all over the place and run in circles and over to Mars and back again and uh, all over the universe. And, and, of course, a lot of support gets stuck in certain areas for a while, sometimes forever, and they never go beyond that. It's hard for them to understand uh, that humans can plan the world and order it in such a way uh, through conniving and world meetings and big agendas, even though they're, they're all uh, published, it's published data on lots of these, these international organizations and their meetings and their agendas, even though it's out there and you know the players, it's still hard for people to imagine that people uh, can actually do this. So they go off into aliens and different things. And yet, they never read their history, or even ancient history, or say, well, how come Egyptians could rule such a vast empire for such an awful, awful long time in today's terms, without losing control? Uh, It's because they understand, they understood at that time the sciences of the mind, and how to control millions of peasants, and keep them in utter ignorance, no education whatsoever, except the indoctrination into their particular religion and state of the world. It's, it's very similar to India. The, the Brahmins kept India in the same state for a couple of thousand years. Quite easily, too. And I often wondered, really, about Britain and India. Uh, who were they working for, when you think about it? Because India was a lot of these little satrapies across, well, of, of different tribes and different areas and caliphs and so on. And Britain really went in and had them all fighting each other until they came into unification. That's what generally comes out of causing skirmishes and dissent amongst different tribes. You stir them up, they fight each other, and then you walk in to give them peace, you see, to create peace, just like the UN's doing today. And, uh, and then they create one big empire. And the British taxpayers funded all the railroads that are still used there yet. And, and they gave them the system of, of control. Uh, and the Brahmins were still in charge, and still are today. Uh, it's a science behind it, controlling people. And the cunningness that we, we can't think of uh, comes naturally when you're born into families that discuss this kind of stuff at the dinner table as you grow up. You understand how the techniques are, are used. It's very simple. And even when we have big players coming out belonging to international organizations, working for a planned society, people who are proponents for it, like Carl Quigley, who was all for the world society, a socialist society, which really means run by the capitalists on a socialist control basis, right down to population numbers and what you need and who should marry whom. The whole agenda that would go into Brave New World that Huxley talked about. So, there's, there's no real differences between right and left whatsoever. They're all run by the same group at the top. And that's why the, the agenda rolls, steam rolls forward, regardless of the front man that's been put in. It's the people behind them who are more important, because they generally have a history in academia and with published books with the agenda in their books, where presidents and prime ministers generally say nothing at all. They're just picked to be the front. Now, Quigley talks about technocrats. Technocrats, he said, were people who worked behind the scenes, who were not elected by the public in any political capacity. He said they had more power, real power, than any politician or prime minister or president. 
because they had the backing of the private banks. They had the backing of the big uh, institutions, the charitable multi-trillionaire institutions that really ran the NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And they got things done. And they didn't have to answer to the public. They didn't have to go through red tape to get things done. They just got it done. Just like over last week I was mentioning about all the, 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 or, the organizations for planned parenthood and so on, which really is abortion and sterilization. Uh, Margaret Sanger founded it and said that children were weeds and the best thing you could do was kill them. That's in her own writings, by the way. I'm not, uh, you know, slandering her. So, and Obama, of course, has talked at Planned Parenthood. There's, there's videos up on YouTube with him giving lectures about it. He loved Kinsey, by the way. He thought Kinsey the pervert was a great guy. They all do, though, you see. That, because Kinsey was put out to destroy all of us and our society and our ability to bond to each other, which was your ability to defend yourselves and live independently. If you destroy all that, everyone's dependent on the state. The state is big daddy, and daddy then gives you the agenda, including sterilization. And John Holdren, of course, etc., are all for that. But let's pick another guy, too, who's been so important in creating the whole world agenda. At least is part of it, I should say. And and that was a little guy from Canada, who I think is related to the, the banking family in the States, too, Maurice Strong. And Maurice Strong gave us the Earth Charter on behalf of his mentors, the Rockefellers. Uh, He's been in and out of the top positions, even head of the the World Bank at the United Nations. He has been over to China, working for a while on behalf of the United Nations, setting up the trade system for China, U.S., Britain, and France, and Germany. His aunts, even, and relatives are buried in China because they were revolutionaries. They went across the world helping to bring in world communism, and they're buried next to the great Mao Zedong. So these are these characters go down intergenerationally through their families with their purposes, and they know what they're up to and, and what they're striving for. They're the real technocrats, incredible power. They brought them over to, to Ontario to, to privatize the entire of Ontario a public uh, electrical utility service. That was nuclear plants and everything. He closed some down and he said he would would never get them fixed. He also said, we're going into an age of austerity back in the early 90s. And he said, uh, eventually we'll have to put in big generators, uh, you know, diesel types to run the essential businesses like governments and so on. Because he, he knew, through the Earth Charter, he knew we were going down this path and they were going to take our energy from us and really make us pay. Well, here's an article here, and it's from the Financial Post, and it's about Maurice Strong. It says, the master of green socialism. Maurice Strong has been central to the reformating, or reformulating socialism's grand narrative in radical environmental terms. May 27th, 2010, by Peter Foster. There's nothing uh, that inspiring global governors... Now, this is a good term. This guy's given you the right stuff here. He doesn't make it in bold, but he hopes you think. Aspiring global governors love so much as recognition of their vast good intentions. And you are in the age of global governors and managers. Today, octogenarian citizen of the world, Maurice Strong, receives one of this year's four freedoms awards established by the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute and the Roosevelt Stichting in the Netherlands. The four freedoms are those relating to speech and religion and from want and fear and are at the roots of the United Nations Charter. Mr. Strong's award comes under the want category. The citation notes his modest role as the foremost guardian of the world's environment. So now you know who, who's in charge of your environment. Also his commitment to social justice. Inconveniently, that latter commitment has recently come to the attention of Fox News' Glenn Beck, who's not the first to notice that social justice actually means forced redistribution, which means socialism, which has created more want than any system devised by man. Mr. Strong has been central to reformulating socialism's grand narrative in radical environmental terms. He was a mastermind of the seminal UN environmental conferences at Stockholm in 1972 and Rio in 1992. And by the way, he's got this one coming up in 2012, I think I mentioned that. 
to an article here. He's a key promoter of the subversive anti-market concepts of sustainable development and corporate social responsibility, meaning private, like private corporations run the world. He's a godfather of climate change hysteria, and that's true. Mr. Beck fingers Mr. Strong as part of a cabal, exotically dubbed Crime Inc., that wants to take down the global economy en route to taking global control. And it's right on, that's what it's all about. It's actually done. It's actually done. The whole takedown of the banking system, it took the collusion of the banks to do it. Because, of course, they're all in it, too. They're part of it. Mr. Strong has posted a brief article on his website, www.morrisstrong.net, in which he responds to misinformation, misinterpretation, and outright lying by my critics. He didn't say enemies, he says critics. I'm sure you want to see enemies. The only critic he mentioned is not Glenn Beck, but yours truly, that's the author of the article. And he said, nor does this, he, he deal with the points raised by Mr. Beck, who on his TV show brought up an interview that Mr. Strong gave almost 20 years ago in which he opined on a novel that he was thinking of writing. It would involve a cabal of concerned citizens taking control of the globe. Mr. Beck noted that Mr. Strong had not found the time to write such a novel. Rather, he seemed to be living the plot himself. And he did, he gave an interview, Murray Strong, about taking over the world. It was a novel that was rattled around in his, idea, in his head. He also mentioned the world bankers, but I'll be part of it, which of course they are. In his website, Defense, Mr. Strong cites a particularly dishonest statement by longtime critic Peter Foster, a description of which I must admit gave me a warm glow. This statement was to his own editor, citing a fictional account which was clearly stated to be an extreme scenario of what might happen by the year 2030. Let's find out what he said when we come back from this break. Reading an article about Maurice Strong, and these people are so important because they don't get into the papers too often unless they're getting an award for some wonderful work of charity and so on across the, some place in the world. Uh, but really, there's such big movers and shakers and the Earth Charter that really is to put us all into the depopulation agenda has already rammed through in the 90s. Every country signed on to it. It was a private organization, drafted this up uh, to for our own good, mind you. And they have a next one coming up shortly, too, in a, in a year or so. And uh, Murray Strong hopes to live long enough to attend that. I'm sure he will, because they do get life extension, these characters. I mean, even his mentor at 94, Rockefeller, is still going around the planet giving talks about depopulation. And there's his protege, uh, Maurice. Now, Maurice was picked up as a, a teenager by Rockefeller. This is the story. This is the sort of story they give you, the official one. And uh, groomed by them and then put in charge of oil companies and shown how the world really worked, you know. I'm sure they really did show them how the world really worked, too. And then set him to work as the great uh, charitable character who was so concerned about world affairs and, and the need to depopulate very quickly and to get rid of the inferior types and who should be and who should not. That's all, in, that's all part of it. Then they got all the world to sign on their Earth Charter where we were debased to below the levels of insects because even they have rights and we don't. And, of course, the Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century United Nations. Big cabal runs this world, all working together in different areas, but they're all a pyramid structure taking orders from the top. But this guy, this guy goes on to say, this writer here, he says, he was accused of dishonesty by Strong. He said, my dishonesty apparently consisted in quote, uh, quoting Mr. Strong verbatim from his autobiography called Where on Earth Are We Going? My main point was not his ghastly and ridiculous scenario, but his clearly stated opinion that the possibility of billions of people being wiped out by eco-apocalypse represented a glimmer of hope for civilization. Where my editor came in, I wrote, was that he didn't believe that anybody could write such a thing, but it's right there on page 22 of Maury Strong's own writing. For the record, here's a reference which takes the form of a report. This is the fictional report in his novel, you see. Actually, I think it's more realistic, to be honest with you. Uh, and it says, a report to shareholders of Earth, Inc. This is Maury Strong, because he does work for Earth, Inc., you see. This is 1st of January 2031, report to the shareholders, Earth, Inc. Some areas of our planet have been almost entirely depopulated. More people are dying and dying younger. Birth rates have dropped sharply, while infant mortality increases. 
At the end of the decade, the best guesstimate of total world population is some 4.5 billion, fewer than at, than at the beginning of the twent of the century. And experts have predicted that the reduction of the human population may well continue to the point that those who survive may not number more than 1.61 billion people who inhabited Earth at the beginning of the 20th century. A consequence, yes, of death and destruction. But in the end, a glimmer of hope for the future of our species hmm, and its potential for regeneration. Interesting, eh? This guy's got so much power. And we've all signed treaties that he's helped to draft up, giving all our rights away, rights over ourselves and our own reproduction, by the way, and our future and your food supply. And that's, he's telling you what their agenda is right here. It says, like Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty Mr. Strong seems to believe that words should mean whatever he wants them to mean. That's why he's criticized about it, you see. Orwell pointed out that the totalitarian instinct for obfuscation naturally seeks to reverse meaning. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And his self-exoneration, Mr. Strong seeks to squirm around his own frequent assertions that he is a socialist. What he really believes in is responsible capitalism. That means, you know, total control of everybody's lives. He writes that... uh, he writes that his call for a modifications of ballot box democracy has been woefully misconstrued. Not. In fact, Mr. Strong has for decades masterminded a strategy to outflank democracy both from above via the UN organizations, they're all private by the way, and from below through the well-funded radical non-governmental organizations that are sold as the voice of civil society. When Mr. Strong averts that he wants more, not less democracy, what he means is more control by non-governmental organizations, which they run, of course, from their foundations. In a recent article, he wrote that since governments might not like his proposals for a new economic paradigm, then political priority had to be given to the organizations and people participating in this dialogue. That is, the kind of organizations he allowed into Rio to browbeat the delegates. And so it goes on and on and on. But you see, these people are out there. They've been out there for an awful, awful long time. And before Strong, they had other ones out there. Because there have been people working for centuries on this agenda to bring in the control society. You know, though, to make sure that everyone lives the way that they should live, according to those who are the control freaks above them. That's what it's all about. The planned society. And even if you read the exchange of letters between Huxley and Orwell, uh, they both knew, because they knew a lot of these elitists in their own day, and they they knew a real history which is uh, omitted from the school books uh, that we're taught with, you see. Uh, They knew the real history because they, they, they came from the upper elite, and they mixed with the people who sat and talked about these things at their dinner tables. And they discussed, would it be a totalitarian um, regime, dictator style to start with, or would it be more along the way of Brave New World? And what you've got is both for this particular time. We're cutting through the matrix. Now, after reading that article about Maury Strong and his plans for massive depopulation and uh, starvation and everything would come into play to bring down uh, to the magic number the population that he wanted with his other masters, of course, and they'd rule the planet in a scientifically proper way, from cradle to grave. Well, they've already done a lot of that already, you see. They had to destroy the family unit. That was, been a, that was a prime mandate a long time ago. That's why you got the, the, the 60s and the swinging 60s, as he called it, and the drugs and uh, the so-called sexual revolution. And you have to go into the predecessors as strong to find out that they were writing about that and trying to get it off the ground in the late 1800s, like H.G. Wells. Well, some of the first books he wrote uh, and novels he wrote on behalf of his masters was to all to promote uh, sexual um, freedoms. And free love, he called it, in the late 1800s. Recycled in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, and then they brought it back in the 60s with better drugs and uh, television to help them out and music and the big media industry that was all controlled by the same people. You see? Still is. But uh, they've been very successful. Everything's been turned upside down. Everybody's viewpoints are altered. I just watched a a, a good video on... uh, the Kinsey, Kinsey Institute, of course. Kinsey was a sexual 
pervert himself. Uh, all these statistics and, and studies were fudged. He used uh, deviants to do the tests themselves. Uh, he was into little boys himself. He preferred them. He also had sex with uh, the guys that worked with him. He, he brought them all together and says we should all use two sex with each other. This is all on record, by the way. And out of that came uh, Hefner. Hefner was a devotee working, I'm sure, in, in league with these guys, all coming out at the same time to give you playboy and so on, and to literally weaponize natural tendencies until they became obsessions. And that tied in, too, with the sexual education to younger and younger children to have even had taught people saying we should teach them to masturbate in school at the age of six and seven. And I've read the articles from the UN uh, last year from, from this. So this goes on and on and on. And you think, you think that society is just getting more open and yada, yada, yada. And there's so much crime and so on, but that's got nothing to do with all the, the things I've just been discussing. It's all tied in together. Now, remember the last article, Maurice Strong, depopulation, uh, people dying off through starvation, sterility, all that stuff. You've got John Holdren and his science czar, and a whole bunch of them appointed behind Obama, because Obama's just a front man. And uh, this is a continuation of the agenda. Now, here's a good article here to show you how they're continuing the agenda. We've had the articles recently about suicide. Uh, the death clinic in Switzerland that's had a lot of exposure was found to be dumping the urns. they taking money for it, of course, after they cremate the people, dumping the urns in a lake. Uh, divers found hundreds of them uh, when they told them they were disposing of them in a proper fashion. They're just getting some employee to come out with a rowboat and dump them all. But anyway, they're now going into uh, killing people who have nothing wrong with them physically, They've just got a bit of depression, etc., and they're willing to pay to be bumped off hygienically. Hitler would be, he'd love that hygienic, you know, hygienic cleansing. It's all here, but it's authorized, you see, from the top under different guys to help people who are kind of miserable, you see. So that also came through in the talks that, that uh, were given at Berkeley by Aldous Huxley. When he talked, he says, most people you know, he says, most people are, they're rather unhappy. He didn't say unhappy. Those guys are a strange language. He said, unhappy, you see. And, you know, they're not really pleased with life. And it's not too good to them. Well, for most folk down below him, you see, it was a pretty miserable existence going through war after war and created depressions and getting stuffed together in city uh, factory towns uh, as you were thrown off the lands. Uh, it doesn't make you terribly joyful. But anyway... Uh, that was all part of the plan as well. Here's an article here uh, to, 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 again, bolster that idea, to get you all talking about it and thinking about it. And I'm sure it'll be on talk shows and operas and all that kind of stuff to make sure you get the message. Should this be the last generation? And it's from New York Times. This is an intentional article, you see, to, to stir up the, contra the controversy. Have you ever thought about whether to have a child? Have you thought about that? If so, what factor has entered into your decision? Was it whether having children would be good for you, your partner, and others close to the possible child, such as children you may already have, or perhaps your parents? For most people, contemplating reproduction, these are the dominant questions. Some may also think about the desirability of adding to the strain that the nearly 7 billion people already here are putting on our planet's environment. But very few ask whether coming into existence is a good thing for the child itself. Most of those who consider that question probably do so because there's some reason to fear that the child's life would be especially difficult. For example, if they have a family history of a devastating illness, now, the one I remember going to the temp, the, the, saying who breeds and who doesn't, you know, it's quite, this is your little psychological article that's churned out by the pros at the top. Physical or mental that cannot yet be detected prenatally. All this suggests that we think it is wrong to bring into the world a child whose prospects for a happy, healthy life are poor. But we don't usually think the fact that a child is likely to have a happy, healthy life is a reason for bringing the child into existence. This has come to be known amongst philosophers as the asymmetry, and it's not easy to justify. But rather than go into the explanations usually proffered, why they fail, I want to raise a related problem. How good does life have to be to make it a reasonable to bring a child into the world? 
Is the standard of life experienced by most people in developed nations today good enough to make this decision unproblematic in the absence of specific knowledge that the child will have a severe genetic disease or other problems? That's a reinforcement. They always do a reinforcement when you try and get key things into your brain, you see. The 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer held that even the best life possible for humans is one in which we strive for ends that once achieved bring only fleeting satisfaction. Well, maybe that's how Schopenhauer uh, felt it himself, but it doesn't mean we all feel it the same way, so why even quote him? New desires then lead us on to further futile struggle, and the cycle repeats itself. So life, you see, sucks. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Life really sucks, and uh, and most people are unhappy, unhappy, as Mr. Huxley would have said, and really they're telling you not to have children, especially ones who might, might mind you, and might not um, have genetic problems, you see. And there's lots of these articles getting churned out there, and you know where they come from, a lot of them. A lot of them are given, uh, and you see this again in Star Suckers, the, the, the documentary on how the media manipulates your whole existence and your reality. Uh, they show you uh, that the public relations companies, the big marketing companies that, that work on behalf of guys like Maurice Strong's organizations and so on, give out handouts to the media who simply put it in verbatim and put another uh, journalist's name on it. Because the journalists today don't go out and look for stories. And they're overworked because they cut back lots of them years ago and they don't do investigative research. And they're so happy to dump these things right in your newspapers to get. And, of course, it's all to manipulate your mind. So big marketing companies are in charge. And they're the, they're the experts at mind manipulation. They're in charge of giving you what you think are the topics you're going to prattle on about. And they're embedded with little things that go into your mind, little particular uh, weaponized quotes and so on, that's meant to stick there. And, and you will come to opinions thinking they're yours. And you'll have little chats about it. Remember what, what Brzezinski said in Between Two Ages, his book, that shortly the public will be unable to think or reason for themselves. They'll only be able to repeat what they get from the mainstream media the day before. And they'll chat about it the next day amongst themselves. That's been going on all my life. So this stuff is put out for you to, it's weaponized. The media is weaponized. It always has been weaponized. And experts put it together using particular terms, ways of streaming things together, even the thought streaming. So you'll follow that stream. And bingo, it's implanted, embedded in your brain and it becomes your opinion, and you don't you don't know why. You couldn't even discuss why you came to. The, you just take them and run with them, and you'll even get hostile and defend them if someone questions you. And the world goes on as always, you know, left wing, right wing. Remember, on the on the uh, the left wing and right wing paradigm, you've always got uh, hiding the body, the bird, a shield. You see, what do you think the shield's there for? Because it's the body. The body that runs the show. And it's always hidden behind the shield. Con games left and right, left and right. The paradigm. The, the dialectic. And as I said before, we vote the, the people out of office because we're so sick of them. And, and you bring in the guy that's promised you the newest hope, you see. And he goes on like the previous one. No wonder because it's the same bunch behind them, you see. But I'm talking about Obama, for instance. The same bunch. The same in Britain as well. Same in, same in Britain. Here's an article here on the U.S. secret wars expanding globally as special operations forces take the larger role. Okay. And it says, uh, by Karen DeYoung and Greg Jaffe, Washington Post staff writer, beneath its commitment to sell soft-spoken diplomacy and beyond the combat zones of Afghanistan and Iraq, the Obama administration has significantly expanded a largely secret U.S. war against Al-Qaeda and other radical groups. Now, the, the important part is other radical groups. I mean, what do they do? who defines what's radical? You ever wondered about that? According to senior military and administration officials, special operations forces have grown both in number and budget and are deployed in 75 countries, 75 countries, compared with about 60 at the beginning of last year. In addition to units that have spent years in the Philippines and Colombia, teams are operating in Yemen and elsewhere in the Middle East Africa, and Central Asia. 
Commanders are developing plans for increasing the use of such forces in Somalia, where a special operations raid last year killed the alleged head of Al-Qaeda in East Africa. They've killed these guys about ten times over. They always give us the same leaders killed again, same with their drone attacks, you know. Plans exist for preemptive or retaliatory strikes in numerous places around the world meant to put into action uh, when a plot has been identified or after an attack linked to a special group. The surge in special operations deployments, along with intensified CIA drone attacks in western Pakistan as the other side of the national security doctrine of global engagement and domestic values, President Obama released last week. One advantage of using secret forces for such missions is that they rarely discuss their operations in public. <laughs> no kidding. I'll, I'll, I like the intellects that write these. For a democratic president such as Obama, who was criticized from either side of the political spectrum for too much or too little aggression, then acknowledged CIA drone attacks in Pakistan, along with unilateral U.S. raids in Somalia and joint operations in Yemen, provide politically useful tools. Well, that's what the U.S. is. It's a politically, it's a politically useful tool. That, that's what the whole function of the U.S. is, you know, a politically useful tool. And once it's finished, it'll be wrung out like a sponge, all torn and shredded, and nothing to wring out anymore, and then it's dumped in the garbage. And I'm not kidding about that. I'm not kidding about that. Obama, one senior military official, said, has allowed things that the previous administration did not. Yep. Change is good, eh? Change is good. Yet we're going to have more battles, more wars, more, more special forces doing assassinations across the planet. They should really say more is good, isn't it? More is good. Because that's really what we're talking about here. More is definitely good, according to them. They're always, you know, the U.S. is fantastic, uh, and Britain was all, you know, the people who fought in wars were awful good for fighting other people's wars for them. But ne- they'll never stand up for themselves. Yeah, you ever wondered about that, too? Eh? They, they, they can get soaked and screwed for taxis after taxis, lose their houses, and, and still supply taxis for the military for other people's ends. But they'll never stand up at home and say enough is enough. And they lose their houses and everything else, and their whole society is completely as dysfunctional as they are destroyed from within. And they'll go off yet and fight other people's battles. And pay for it as well. Very useful. Special. I tell you that they're very special in that way. See, Britain's already kaput, it's finished. No, none of these countries could ever pay off any kind of debt that they have. None of it. None of it. They could never pay it off. Unless they tore it up, which of course would be the logical thing to do. But of course they won't do that because they're, 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 they're run. They're run by the ones who run the money. That's as simple as that. Getting back to the, the cut down the children stuff and all the rest of it, it's an article here from Sky News about Britain's unofficial one child policy. I should also mention that, that Britain, Canada and Australia are teaching teachers in these packages that they get, these tool packages, you know, special tools, toolkits, you call them, that uh, to be on the lookout for abuse in children. And they've said that uh, large families uh, are prone to, more prone to abuse. That's what they've come to the conclusion, you see, because they really don't like those with large families. A- and anyone with two children, over two children, is considered a large family. Actually, get, two is getting there already, according to them. In Australia, they've already put in the policies to, I don't know if they've actually done it yet, to start to tax the people extra for their carbon output for that child. And it's burden on society. As, of course, they open the floodgates even wider and wider for immigration. <laughs> the same con's been pulled everywhere, isn't it? So in this article here, as I say, the Sky News, and it says... Um, Yvette Garson wanted to take her children for a swim, but pool attendants in Bolton insisted that Ryan and Jordana, each five and two respectively, each had to be accompanied by an adult. If only Ms. Ms. Garzaid, a lone parent, of course, because that's what Britain's comprised of, had brought along an, an only child. The nanny state has rehabilitated single mothers like her and is now bent on engineering the same outcome for single children. It will amount to a remarkable turnaround. In 1896, Stanley Hall, founder of the American Journal of Psychology, concluded that being an only child is a disease in itself. 
See, they're already working on this back then. you got to understand this. you got to understand this has been going on for an awful long time. This whole agenda and the world agenda and the geopolitical agenda has just has been the same for all over a hundred years. Since then, scores of academic studies have reinforced the cruel stereotype of singletons, like that, singletons, as spoiled misfits deprived of siblings and the soft skills which often abrasively they impart empathy, conflict resolution, and gratification deferment, to name but three. So it's getting very psychological here. But demography means that such evidence has been trumped by experience. On current trends, one child families will be Britain's dominant family unit by 2020. It already is. And the relative abundance of only child, of one only child has created a demand for reassurance from their parents. Apologists have been quick to respond. So they go on to all this whole, the whole thing about single parent families and that's the way of the future and how the state really is now the daddy and supplies all the rules and regulations and the funding uh, and so on and so on and so on. Really, that's what it's all about. But that's the way of the world now, isn't it? And there's lots and lots of these articles. All to reinforce the, the new normalcy, as even with the new normalcy, they're altering it into the next normalcy. And talking about, talking about the big agenda and how things follow on. It, it really, part one, part two, part three, part, all going along in a, in a planned direction. They can read about in the late 1800s by guys like H.G. Wells, who were prattling on about this back then. Pretty well the same stuff as Maurice Strong and the destruction of society, the dissolution of the family unit, and so on. And it confuses folk. They think of Karl Marx. Well, isn't that what the communists want? And yet, no. Well, it's all the same thing, folks. The capitalists ran both sides. Of course they do. They want an ordered society. They want to be in control forever with their own families. And the planned society, the planned world society. Our worst state than previously thought and signaled that Britain faces years of pain as the spending acts fall. See, it was all your fault, folks. Yeah. It was all, all your fault. Nothing to do with these creeps in government with their social agendas, bringing society down till, till, till they're destroyed and then reformulating it. Nothing to do with the Murray Strongs who say, oh yeah, famine and plague and, and disease, or alternative system to use. You know, they had lots and lots and lots of dough. But that falls right in with the depopulation, isn't it? That's not what rationing you bring in yet too. We're talking about rationing across the world. Right on cue with the UN Department of Agriculture, who said they'd eventually distribute the whole world's food supply to certain regions, and you better bring down your populations because they would not increase your rations. Yeah, it's all coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. From Hamish myself, Ontario, Canada, it's good night to your God, or your gods go with you.